Hello and welcome to our first Bitbang talk series, Adapt and Thrive with Customer Analytics. If you've been wondering what all the hype about customer analytics is, and um, maybe you're questioning whether or not it's even worth putting all the effort into gathering this data, uh, well, you're in the right place. That's what we'll be discussing today. Uh, however, if we don't manage to answer a particular question that you have for us, do ask us in the question below and we will get back to you. Uh, you'll find all sorts of ways to connect with us in the attachment section. Um, and we've also left a link for the webinar uh, there too. Um, so for the introductions, let's go to the slides. Okay, so uh, I'm Kelly, I'm the marketing manager here at Bitbank, uh, and I'll be hosting the webinar. I have with me uh, Giovanni Lorenzoni, CEO at Bitbank, who will be moderating the talk. Hi, Giovanni. Hi, everyone. And a huge welcome to our guest, Brandon Purcell, for joining us all the way from the US. That's right, Brandon. Hey, thanks for having me. No problem. Uh, so Brandon is Forrester's Research Vice President and Principal Analyst. So he's got tons of knowledge behind him and I know he's got some really interesting in insights to share with us today. So thank you, Brandon. And thanks, Giovanni. I'll leave you, I'll leave you um, to start the discussion. Sure. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you, Brandon, again, for being with us today. Uh, Today we are talking about customer analytics and the importance of customer insights, right? So mm -hmm. I would like to uh, begin asking you why customer understanding is such a big deal in this day and age. Yeah, so that's a great question, Giovanni. And this is what I've been covering since I've been at Forrester for six and a half years. And it's absolutely critical for companies to understand why it's so important. I want to walk you through the age of business very quickly defined by certain ways that businesses have outcompeted their competitors to tell you how to adapt and thrive with customer analytics. So let's look at the history of business starting in the beginning of the, the 20th century. At that time, if you were an industrial powerhouse, you were going to win in your markets. Now that changed a little bit in the middle of the 20th century when companies that were able to create these globally connected supply and distribution chains became the dominant forces in business. That changed in the 1990s with the rise of PCs and connected computers when we saw Google and Amazon start to outcompete their competitors. Now, if you think about the source of, of, uh, of differentiation in all of those ages, it was something that you could master internally. That's a bit different than what happened about 12 years ago when increasingly empowered customers started to disrupt entire markets. If you think about what Uber was able to do with transportation or what Airbnb was able to do with hospitality or, or Facebook with the dissemination of information, this we call the age of the customer at Forrester. And in this age, these increasingly empowered customers have complete transparency into their different buying options and so the onus on businesses is to be able to understand these customers and anticipate their needs to be able to win, serve, and retain these customers. And so it's all about customer understanding. Now, the good news here is that you've probably been collecting a lot of data on these customers. Data, of course, is nothing new. Companies started to collect data in the age of distribution with various sources like financial data and sales data. Really in the age of information in the 90s is when we started to get more customer data, maybe third party data that you were buying on your customers to enrich your understanding and transaction data as well. But the real explosion has happened, of course, in the last decade or so with the emergence of various different sources and types of data, behavioral data on your customers, social data, mobile data, and environmental and sensor data from uh, connected sensors, the Internet of Things data that companies are collecting today. So you probably have a lot of data, but in order to win in the age of the customer, you have to be able to turn this data into insights, these golden nuggets, the gold that's buried within your data. That's why data mining as a metaphor has been around so long, because you start with a ton of data and you try to reduce it to useful signals or anomalies that you can use to better win, serve, and retain your customers. 
Now, very simply, when I think about the process of creating and, and getting value from these insights, I think about something that Forrester calls the insights life cycle. So as your customers interact and transact with you, that creates a data footprint. Now, that data in itself isn't useful until you apply analytics to it to unearth these insights. You can think of analytics as the alchemy that changes data into insights. And then this is not an academic exercise. We want to actually take action to capture the value of those insights by changing the way we treat different customers. Now, this is a circular rather than a linear process because after we take action, we need to learn, was the action effective or not? That's a new data point that we can use to continuously optimize this process in a virtuous cycle. So at a very high level, this is what companies need to be doing to win in the age of the customer. Okay, so let, let's try to go deeper and uh, let me ask you, uh, what is customer analytics? How would you define it? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So customer analytics, again, is what I cover at Forrester. And it's really where you see data hit insights here. That's where you're applying customer analytics to unearth those insights. Forrester uh, defines customer analytics as taking customer data, all that data you're collecting, and applying analytic insight, often advanced analytics techniques like machine learning and other data science techniques to find these insights and design customer-focused programs that win, serve, and retain customers. So remember, this is all about taking action. It's about taking this insight and changing the way that you um, interact with your customers based upon what you know about them. To get very specific, when I talk about customer analytics, I'm talking about several different techniques that you can apply to data, customer data, to find insights. Now, this pinwheel diagram, the first time, if it's the first time you're seeing it, it may be a little bit confusing. So I'm just going to spend a minute here um, explaining how to read this. Customer analytics is useful across many different application areas. And that's what we see in green, the different uh, ways in which customer analytics can be applied. So if we start at noon on this clock and go around clockwise, you see contextual marketing, customer analytics to understand customer context, where customers are, how they're feeling. You know, location analysis helps us better understand where our customers are, or sentiment analysis, the emotion of customers. Continuing along, we have customer analytics techniques that help with acquisition. And here you can see behavioral customer segmentation. I get more inquiries about segmentation than um, any, any other technique that you see in this diagram. You know, companies that have access to all of this new data today are struggling to use it to create more dynamic and useful segments. Customer lifetime value analysis is another one here, understanding which of your customers are going to go on to become highly profitable. Continuing along that outer circle there, we have um, retention and loyalty. So using analytics to retain customers and drive loyalty. Um, churn analytics at six o'clock in the diagram here, customer churn modeling, predicting which customers are likely to churn, finding those behavioral patterns that signify that they're at risk of defecting to another brand. Moving along, we have personalization techniques. So the idea of one-to-one -one marketing to customers, understanding that next best product, for, for example. And then finally, if most of the previous application areas are really centered on marketing use cases, that's a bit limiting because customer analytics is incredibly useful for understanding the customer experience, improving the customer experience, even using customer experience as a core differentiator in increasingly commoditized markets like, like financial services. So techniques like satisfaction analysis and customer journey analytics um, are incredibly useful to brands who are trying to improve uh, the customer experience. Okay, uh, I, I feel like customer analytics is quite difficult uh, somehow. I mean, maybe too much difficult for some organization. Uh, I mean, it's not just about the range of method you just presented. I've seen uh, recent market research where uh, data, uh, about data in customer insights and analytics practice where the difficulties do outweigh the improvements. 
So the question uh, that may arise here is uh, why companies are facing so many threatening challenges? Mm. Well, you're, yeah, you're, you're speaking of a sad truth in, in the market, Giovanni, that I hear all the time. As much as I want to talk to my clients about these techniques, mm. oftentimes what I hear from clients is some version of this statement from a large global bank. We are drowning in data and starving for insight. So for most companies, the problem isn't that they don't have enough data. Most companies have spent years collecting massive amounts of customer data, but they're unable to pull it together, to unify it, to create that elusive 360 degree view of the customer, that foundational asset upon which to build analytics. Data is of course the lifeblood of analytics and you need to have quality relevant data in order to do analytics well. Um, and I don't just hear this anecdotally, we actually have our own data at Forrester about this. So this is a survey um, that we've done almost every year I've been at Forrester. We call it our state of customer analytics survey. And we ask folks, what are your top challenges when performing customer analytics and, and measurement? And what you can see here, the top two challenges are related to data, ensuring qu data quality from a variety of sources and accessing data from a variety of sources. And every year we've done this survey, those have been the top two challenges. So data is the biggest problem um, for companies. And that's because they haven't spent enough time and, and resources investing in effective customer data management specific for their analytical use cases. And so typically I tell companies to start with a single use case that's feasible, um, create the ETL, um, extract, transfer, load processes for that data, um, get some value from it and use that as a business case to continue to build out um, your data foundation. After the data challenges, we actually see more people and process challenges. So transforming insights into relevant business actions. Oftentimes we see this challenge arise when there's a centralized analytics team that's creating analytical models for business stakeholders. And when they deliver those models to business stakeholders, the stakeholders either don't trust them or don't understand them, or they miss the mark somehow and they're not useful. Um, and so there needs to be better alignment between these resources. And you can see that in the next challenge as well, getting buy-in from business stakeholders on the value of measurement and analytics. Let's face it, a lot of folks are still doing their jobs based on gut feel rather than based on insights from data. And so that's a big cultural challenge to improve the data literacy of an organization. Um, and then finally, we see challenges in aligning me measurement and analytics technologies and providing real-time insight to the business. You just mentioned the, the, stake, the multiple stakeholder, mm -hmm. and uh, it seems like it's, it's a rise in sophistication in customer analytics. That, that may be... Uh, demands for a larger number of data sources used along with the uh, high quality of this data, which is uh, one of the primary challenges you just mentioned. Uh, in all honesty, how many components do you need to excel in customer insights? And in your experience, uh, are some of these more important than others? Yeah, well, it's it's a great question, Giovanni, and something really that the the reality that we've all been living in with the pandemic brought to light a couple of years ago, what is absolutely critical. And in the similar survey, um, we actually, we saw this very clearly. One of the other questions we asked was, uh, what data sources are you using for customer analytics? And there are kind of two two takeaways from this slide. One is that you can see the top, the most adopted data source, the one that most folks are analyzing is campaign response data. 69% of companies are analyzing it. What's kind of surprising to me about that is it's only 69%, meaning that 31% of companies actually aren't analyzing that data. Similarly, you know, 33% aren't looking at demo data, 36% uh, aren't looking at the transactional or point of sale data. Um, it just goes to show that there's a lot of room for improvement among companies in the types of data and the amount of data that they use for customer analytics. But the bigger message, I think, from this slide is what we see next with anonymous behavioral data, website activity data, content consumption data. From 2019 to 2020, 
the use of that data for analytics jumped by 17%, meaning 17% more companies started using, started analyzing that data in 2020. Why? Well, what happened in 2020? Economy shut down due to the pandemic and customers increasingly only interacted with brands digitally. Companies had to, we hear a lot about the acceleration of digital adoption on the consumer level, but businesses started adopting digital data to better understand those digital customers. You can see a similar but smaller bump in the, uh, the adoption of digital data like web analytics during the same time period. So you asked me, Giovanni, uh, Giovanni, are any elements more critical than others? Well, today you really can't do customer analytics well if you're not incorporating digital data sources into your analyses, things like segmentation and predictive analytics. That is absolutely critical. And then you can also see here that there are um, alternative kind of unstructured data sources companies are using like social media data and um, online communities where companies get feedback on their product services and experience. Those jumped as well. Okay, clear. So we talk about uh, insights, uh, challenges, why it's so important. Uh, now, who should, be who should be responsible in the organization for customer insights? Yeah. Well, if you think about that pinwheel diagram, when I went through the various application areas, a lot of those were marketing applications. And so it's no surprise then that customer analytics typically germinates within mark the marketing function. But what we found is that over the last few years, many other parts of the organization are starting to use analytics as well. I mentioned customer experience, sales teams, product teams, um, and various other operational areas. And so now this question arises like, like, okay, if a lot of different teams need customer analytics, how do we structure for this function? What's the ideal org structure? And we see three different org structures. The first one you see here, we call the dedicated or distributed model, where customer analytics is happening and it's embedded in lines of business. So it's there's folks doing it in marketing, there are folks doing it in sales, in CX, in product, et cetera. Um, this model works well for those line of business focus use cases, but as you can imagine, the, the downside of this model is that there's a fair bit of redundancy in the work that's happening and also a fair bit of inconsistency in the way that data is interpret, interpreted and analytics are performed. And realizing these limitations, a number of companies have actually um, adopted a shared service or completely centralized model for customer analytics, where now if a business unit, say marketing or CX, needs an analysis performed, they'll tap into the shared service, the centralized team who will create that analytical model for them. Now, the challenges that arise here are a bit different. You're able to overcome a lot of those redundancy and, and consistency issues, but that centralized team almost always has bandwidth issues um, because there's a lot of analytics need out there and only so much supply at the centralized level. Additionally, one thing that companies who have adopted this model find is that those centralized resources, because they don't um, specifically master any specific domain, oftentimes the analyses that they create for business units miss the mark because they don't have the domain expertise to create the analysis that is most relevant and meets the, the requirements of that business. So as a result of those limitations, a third model has adopted a center of excellence. We call this the hub and spoke model at Forrester, where you have a centralized team that's focused on overall enterprise analytics and you know, best practices, methodology. But then you have these liaisons who actually sit within the lines of business. So every day they are living and breathing marketing's challenges, trying to address them with analytics and best practices from the centralized team. And there may be similar liaisons in CX and other parts of the business. And so they're able to leverage that centralized team, but they also retain that domain expertise. Now, according to that, the survey I've been talking about, about 42% of companies have the dedicated model, uh, about 32% of companies have the shared service or centralized model, and the remaining around quarter of companies have adopted the center of excellence or hub and spoke model. Now, when we 
you may you may be thinking, okay, what's the best model? Well, when we take those survey respondents and we segment them based on their overall level of maturity with customer analytics from laggards, the people who are just getting started, to followers, to leaders, who are the folks who are, of course, doing the most, we see that leaders over-index for the center of excellence model. You can see in this slide that 48% of leaders have adopted that model when I just mentioned that only about a quarter of companies overall have adopted the center of excellence or hub and spoke model. So leaders over index for that model by a factor of two. And anecdotally speaking to a number of companies who've gone along a similar journey, most folks start in the dedicated model, then they realize the limitations of that, they move to the centralized model, and then they realize the limitations of that, and then they move into the hub and spoke or center of excellence model. Um, Guy Perry, who ran the, um, who was the chief data and analytics officer at Procter and Gamble for quite some time, says that's exactly what his team did. And when they finally landed on the uh, the hub and spoke model, the center of excellence model, it was just right. Everything seems. Uh, uh super but uh i guess uh, some data privacy or legal or regulatory compliance is posing some limitation on what you can do and what you cannot do uh, how this limits the effectiveness of the analysis and uh, how do you foresee the future on this yeah yeah giovanni it's it's a great question. I mean, you know, consumer privacy, there's there's a regulatory aspect. There's also the fact that, you know, customers increasingly have to opt in to their, their data being used by companies. And anytime they don't opt in, that data goes away or there's the right to be forgotten in Europe with GDPR. And so um, companies have to create a very solid value proposition for customers to continue to use their data. If you do customer analytics effectively, of course, it can provide additional convenience and value to customers. But there are a few things to, to be aware of on the horizon. For instance, you know, it's GDPR wasn't the end of European regulation in the space. In, in many ways, it was just the beginning. So last year, they released the text for the Artificial uh, Intelligence Act in Europe, which will be enacted potentially next year, maybe in, in early 2024. And it's a regulation that all EU members are obliged to adopt that regulates how, when, and how rigorously um, uh, companies working in Europe can use artificial intelligence. Um, and as most of the people on this webinar realize, you know, AI, if not um, created and adopted carefully can have bias, can, can be completely opaque. Um, and so Europe is trying to address many of those challenges. And so companies are going to have to start thinking very carefully about the type of customer data that they use in AI and whether or not the outcomes from that model are fair, because if they don't, the price could be really high. So maximum fines for non-compliance of this artificial intelligence act will be 6% of global turnover or 36 million euros, whichever is the higher. So for folks who are um, who went through the GDPR uh, changes, this is very similar with similar similarly high consequences. Um, and it's not easy, you know, every company wants to be fair. It seems like because companies at this point realize that if they're not very careful, there can be harmful bias embedded in AI. Many have espoused certain ethical AI principles and fairness is one of the most common ethical AI principles. You know, a diverse set of companies from, um, you know, Google and IBM and Microsoft, and then also um, non-tech companies like BMW and even the Vatican have espoused these principles. But at the end of the day, what does it mean to be, to be fair using AI? I've done some research into fairness at, in AI and uh, found that fairness is very much in the AI of the beholder. Um, and that's, that's a pun, but it speaks to something very serious, which is there are 21 different mathematical representations of fairness. And so how you actually define fairness, the criteria that you apply to your AI algorithms is incredibly dependent upon your context the types of harms that that 
uh, fairness definition could do in practice to groups of customers and your overall goals and strategy. This is an example of, how, of two different classes of fairness. So let's say we wanna use AI to hire folks, which many companies are doing today, using AI to read through res resumes and score candidates based upon what AI finds. Now, at first glance, that's objective, right? Because a computer is doing it as opposed to a biased human. But we all know that there's bias in the data that went in to create that system. So how do we make sure that it's fair? Well, on the one hand, we could take these eight candidates and we could just pick the ones who have a score greater than 90. This, If we did this, this is where we've tried to optimize the system for accuracy. Um, we've optimized equality within the system. And so when we were training the system and evaluating it, we looked at scores of males versus females, and we tried to optimize for the true positive rate or the true positive and false positive rate, different representations of accuracy, saying that, okay, if you're, a, uh, in this case, a qualified female, you have an equal likelihood of getting the job as a qualified male. So we're optimizing for equal treatment. That's very different from what's happening on the right side here, where we're actually going to optimize for equity in the outcome. So we're accepting that there's bias in the system that we can't eradicate. And so we're actually going to try to engineer fairness into the system. And here we had four females and four males apply. So we're going to try to recreate that distribution in the folks we hire. We're hiring the top three males and the top three females. This is more focused on equity. These are just two overall classes. Like I mentioned before, there are 21 different ways of optimizing fairness in an AI system. And how you do it really depends on a deep understanding of the context of the decisions you're making and how that's going to impact various groups of people. And not just high level groups, but also subgroups. You know, here we're focused on men and women, but you might also look at um, men and women across races and ethnicities as well. Very, very interesting. Um, I'm sure companies are trying to equip themselves to perform as, as best they, as they can, uh, customer analytics and customer insights. I mean, it's, it's part of the, of the rule you said. Now we, we live in a uh, customer-obsessed world, so we, we have to do it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but how would you describe a leader in customer analytics? Yeah, sure, Giovanni. Well, when we when we take that survey data I've I've been uh, presenting, and we we single out the leaders from the followers and laggards, we look for a few different things. Um, First of all, I'll just say that there's only a few companies who kind of meet that leader status. Here you can see about a third of companies have reached the leader status, where 42%, the largest proportion, are laggards just starting their analytics journey. And there's 24% of companies who are really in the middle there. But what are these folks doing differently, to, to answer your question, Giovanni? Well, on the one hand, they're using a lot more data. You can see here that leaders on average are using 11 different data sources. So campaign response data, you know, transactional data, certainly digital data, um, and other oftentimes unstructured sources such as customer feedback data um, from chats in the call center. Followers are only using on average six data sources and laggards are on average using four data sources. Um, so leaders are using more data, diverse types of data, more dynamic data that's captured in real time. And they are also much more likely to use digital data. You can see here that 92% of the leaders in our survey have adopted digital data for customer analytics. Um, they're also much more likely to use social media data um, and uh, data from online communities. And I think it's important to highlight what those two data sources do. You know, digital data, on the one hand, we've talked about quite a bit, a dynamic understanding of the customer in the moment, in the digital moment. But social media and online community data, um, while you can't usually tie it to that individual customer, it gives you a sense of why customers are interacting and transacting in the way that they are, um, which is something that digital data, transactional data, demo data doesn't do. 
um, how customers are feeling, what they expect of you. Are you delivering on the experiences that they expect? This is a, this, these are increasingly important um, types of data, especially in the age of the customer. Um, as I said in the beginning, when it's all about meeting customers' needs and anticipating them. There's also, of course, the fact that leaders are just doing a lot more analytics. You know, on average, leaders are, are performing 18 different types of customer analyses from lifetime value analysis to behavioral segmentation to churn modeling to product propensity modeling, journey analytics, text analytics on customer data. Leaders are doing it all. Followers are doing quite a bit. Um, <clears throat> I will say that followers on average have started to overcome their data challenges. That's you know the core stumbling block. Once they're able to overcome those, they can build analytics pretty rapidly. And laggards are just you know doing what they can with the limited data they have available to them. Giovanni. Yeah, let me let me ask you. Uh, so we we started talking about, uh, I mean, the title of your uh, presentation today is Adapting and Thriving with Customer mm -hmm. Analytics. So uh, do you have suggestions on, on how to deal with customer analytics, how to compete uh, yeah. against companies and your peers with customer analytics? Yeah. So the adaptation piece is, is so critical. And that's like when you saw that jump in the use of anonymous behavioral digital data um, adoption, that was companies adapting to the new reality. And even if we, we enter a post-pandemic world, the need for that type of data, real-time dynamic data on customers isn't going away. Um, so that's adapting, but how do you actually thrive with customer analytics? And, and in order to thrive, I think it's important to have a, a vision in mind for what a, an ideal customer analytics scenario is in a, an organization, almost that holy grail or nirvana state of customer analytics. And at Forrester, we refer to this as the next best experience and of course, the idea of a next best product offer or action, that's nothing new. We're building on that. But the next best experience differs from those things because if you think about next best product offer and action, all of those things really existed in a marketing context in pursuit of marketing objectives. With next best experience, it could, the next best experience could be a marketing experience, an offer, for example. But it could just as easily be a customer experience, a service experience, a product experience, some sort of enrichment experience for customers on um, products they, or services they already own. So here we're commingling data from different, different business domains, not just marketing, also those various other areas. We're performing analytics on it, and then we're identifying what is the right experience to deliver to this customer in this moment. And right is actually determined partially by the customer, him or herself. We're not just fo laser focused on what we want to achieve with the customer, but we're taking more of an outside in perspective. What is the customer trying to achieve with us? What's gonna deliver value to this customer so that they keep coming back? Um, now we still wanna be profitable and we need a metric to optimize for. And so instead of optimizing for shorter term conversions or clicks or upsell, cross-sell ratios, things that companies have have optimized for in the past, here we're gonna look long-term and optimize for the long-term profitability of that customer. Long-term profitability is another way of saying customer lifetime value. Now this may sound kind of high level and esoteric, so let me give you an example from retail banking. I found that um, large banks are the closest to achieving this, this paradigm in practice. So let's say we are a large retail bank and we're very analytically advanced. And so you can see on the lower left here, we have, we're doing all of the various customer analytics techniques in that pinwheel diagram I presented before. And we are tracking customers as they go on journeys with us. And so we see a customer who's on, she logs into her online banking session. So she's on a digital journey. And she, she opens her checking account and she searches for how to close that account. Well, we're doing customer churn modeling and her likelihood to churn or to defect increases 20% because of that action. 
So if she just stopped the journey there, it'd be very clear what we want to do. You know, if she's profitable, we probably want to try to save her somehow with a retention campaign. But the journey doesn't stop there. Next, she goes and she looks at a product. She looks, let's say she looks at a credit card. Well, we're doing product propensity modeling. So her likelihood to, to need that credit card goes up 20%. Okay, well, now we could also send her an offer for the credit card. But the journey continues. She goes back into her checking account and she tries to wire transfer money to her mother. But something happens and the wire transfer doesn't go through. Okay, well, now she has some sort of customer service issue that needs to re be resolved. So her service propensity goes up 20%. What do we do in this scenario with this customer? Well, there's three different interventions that we could deliver to her. We could send a product offer, a retention incentive, or we could proactively reach out and fix her problem. Now, what's happening today is many companies are just doing all three things at the same time, which results in a discordant experience for the customer. What the next best experience research says is that we've probably be, been unwittingly testing this in the past by sending these various experiences to customers. So should, we should look at past customers and see what the average impact has been of these various interventions on their lifetime value. And we may find that while each intervention has a positive impact on the average lifetime value of customers, the one with the greatest impact is proactively reaching out fixing this customer's wire transfer to her mother, because that's going to engender the type of loyalty that's going to um, encourage her to keep, um, keep her business with us and grow her business with us. And so we're going to do that. And so in the world of next best experience, customer lifetime value is the common currency that you can use to arbitrate between candidate experiences. Now, if you're saying, okay, well, that requires a high degree of analytical sophistication. We're not there yet. Um, nobody's there yet. Like I said, some banks are getting close, but this is intentionally aspirational. It's important to know where you want to go so you can start to build towards it. So if you're stuck within the data doldrums, I would say really focus on that customer data management. As you overcome that, start to focus on building those models, prioritize the models that are going to have the highest value. Uh, to your business. And then eventually you'll find yourself in a position where you'll have multiple models and you'll be able to create this overall decisioning system focused on identifying and delivering the next best experience like we see here. Thank you, Brent. And with such aspirational message, I would uh, close our today's session and give it back to Kelly. Thanks, yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Brandon. Um, it was really, really interesting. So um, I think you've, you've definitely shown how much this world of customer analytics is, is quite uh, sophisticated and can be obviously quite challenging, but um, obviously um, you've got to start step by step. So um, thank you for, for explaining in a bit more detail of these things. Um, so if you do want to get in touch with us, we do help our clients with um, all of this, uh, these services, customer analytics specifically as well. Um, so do get in touch and you've got all our contact information uh, in the attachments. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brandon. Thank you, Giovanni. And um, we'll see you on the next talk series. Thanks so much for having thank me. Thank you. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Bye-bye.